I'm too excited to introduce our, our guests today, so I'm going to start. My name is Kelly McElhaney, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, and one of the partners who is a co-host today, along with the board list and Haas Development and Alumni Relations. Um, the Center for Executive, sorry, Center for Executive Ed, the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership at the Haas School of Business. Our mission is to educate equity fluent leaders. Uh, we go beyond just gender and look at all forms of equity and really just how do we develop leaders who just maximize the construct of inclusive leadership, of equity fluent leadership, understand different lived experiences and really just courageously use your voice and power to promote equity for all in the business world. Um, as I said, we're bringing you this event with our partner, The Board List, and our partner, Haas Development and Alumni Relations. And I'm just gonna move immediately to, well, first just telling you, we're gonna have a 35 minute fireside chat between our two guests, and we're gonna use the Q&A function. So if you have questions, please submit them view, uh, via the Q&A function. And now I'm going to introduce our two esteemed guests. The first is Shannon Gordon. She's the CEO of the board list with whom we have a great partnership. Um, Shannon has spent her career building and scaling innovative customer experiences at retail and logistics companies and is now, as I said, the CEO of the board list. She is currently focused on building technology that brings access and transparency to the expansive, and I really emphasize that word, the expansive pipeline of board ready women. I always say this is not a supply problem. This is a demand problem and the board list exists exactly to tackle that opportunity. Uh, before board list, she was a senior vice president of operations and customer experience at SHIP, a San Francisco startup. She spent five years as VP of customer experience at walmart.com. She was at McKinsey in Chicago. Uh, so she has a very, very long track record of being a successful business leader. Our second guest is my friend and Haas alum, Elena Gomez. She's the CFO at Zendesk. Zendesk is a fantastic um, founding partner of our Center for Equity, Gender and Leadership. So we would not be here if it were not for Elena and her leadership and Zendesk. She was named CFO of Zendesk in May of 2016. Prior to Zendesk, she was at uh, Salesforce where she helped build their world-class finance operation, including the management of the finance and strategy org. Uh, she has a proven experience with managing global um, growth. I was gonna say global health, Elena, I've given you a new title, new job, um, and finance operations for just small multi-billion dollar companies as they broaden their enterprise reach. She, as I said, is uh, an alum of the Haas School of Business, so it is even more exciting to introduce Elena. So Shannon, I'm gonna turn it over to you and to Elena, and thanks so much for, for being here and doing what you do. Oh, thanks, Kelly. It's great to do this today um, and always love uh, participating with this audience. It's usually quite an engaged one, so I will hold this group to the same standard and hope that we get lots of questions in the Q&A as it'll make the conversation I think a lot more interesting. Um, I'm sure many of you are here to hear um, what Elena has to say about this topic, but I did just wanna spend a couple of minutes um, going through a little bit of context setting to help um, everybody uh, to help everybody sort of be on the same page about what has changed actually in the landscape of boards and what the influence or impact has been on diversity specifically. So um, I will just walk through a couple of slides here. I'll keep it to a minimum, as I say, and we'll get into the conversation. So bear with me while I share my screen. Great. Um, so I think part of what's been interesting about what's changed about boards in the last, you know, let's say decade is the massive change in the business landscape. So it's been a direct result of that. You know, we've had a tremendous change in customer demographic and where purchasing power sits. As many of you probably know, tremendous purchasing power for women um, and then millennials has caused a dramatic shift in the way that we think about go to market, the way that we think about the products that we're developing, et cetera. Obviously we've had the constant change and uh, disruption from technology and that is industry agnostic. So there's not a company we ever talk to that's not facing this challenge to some degree, either later stages of it or earlier. 
Um, and then, of course, the tremendous changes in the workforce dynamics, beginning with, you know, war for talent, but then evolution into more of kind of a gig, gig economy, um, et cetera. And even now with COVID, this continues to change. So the reality is that the pace of change has been dramatic and has continued to increase, will likely continue to increase. Um, and the, the issue is that we simply don't have boardrooms and leadership teams that are equipped to keep up from even just a makeup standpoint. So just to give you a few of the stats, which I'm sure thematically you're already familiar with, Fortune 500 boards, we um, have 18% Caucasian women, 16% people of color, private company boards. We unfortunately don't have the stats for people of color, but uh, only 7% of board seats at private companies are held by women. Um, uh, this says corporate executive boards, it should be executive teams, 18% um, women, 14% uh, people of color. So you can see the correlation between boards and executive teams. Um, it's pretty obvious why we have such a limitation as can people continue to progress. Um, and yet, you know, obviously a significant portion of purchasing power, the population, et cetera, are made up of women and people of color. So there's obviously a mismatch in our leadership ranks um, with you know, the overall population, our communities, our employee base, um, and our customers. So that's, that's sort of the fundamental problem. And you know, as Kelly opened her, in her opening comments was saying that it's not a pipeline problem, it's a demand problem. And I think that is true. I would also say that where there is demand, there's also an access problem. So part of the issue is that board seats so often get filled via referral. It's the kind of role that people want a lot of confidence in. They typically are taking recommendations from their network um, and want to feel uh, that the candidate has a high degree of credibility, integrity, et cetera. And oftentimes that sort of confidence comes from personal, personal professional relationships. Um, so 96% of board seats are actually filled in an informal network. We're not talking search firms. We're not talking, you know, any sort of tools online. We are, we are talking about just person to person. So as you, of course, know, within those networks, you know, and unfortunately, the network, as we talked about um, on the previous page, is pretty homogeneous at this point. And so we don't actually have a lot of uh, diverse candidates that are actually in those networks, in those closed door conversations, and therefore getting their names kind of popping to the top of the list when those board seats open. So, you know, our belief is that one, yes, we do have more of a demand problem, certainly than a supply or pipeline issue. In fact, that's not an issue at all. Uh, if anything, it's the opposite, that there's such a tremendous um, pipeline of incredible talent um, that is just not getting the opportunities because of a lack of familiarity or connectivity to those networks. Um, but this is changing. So there has been, you know, we hear about all this in the news, but sometimes I feel it's helpful to just write down on a piece of paper over the last, this is even in a seven year time period, everything that's happened. So, you know, we start talking about gender uh, issues in the workplace in 2013, um, Me Too movement happens in 2017. And from there, you know, some pretty significant movement, um, both with institutional investors and within governments. So, you know, and I'll touch on both of those briefly because I think they're very important. Institutional investors, you know, everyone from BlackRock to State Street Advisors um, to a bit later, you know, Goldman Sachs are uh, almost without exception have put policies in place that say that the, the mandate that their investments need to have some level of diversity on the board. And that ranges, of course, in terms of teeth of the policy. It's, it's either an ask or an influence. And in some cases, in the Goldman Sachs case, for example, they will not take companies public any longer that don't have at least one diverse individual on their board. So that has been a tremendous shift. And as you might imagine, these are investors that have a tremendous amount of influence um, on the boardrooms of particularly um, private companies and, and certainly public as well if they're, uh, if they're largely invested there. And then the second theme has been what's been going on with legislation. So in 2018, Many of you I'm sure know, uh, California passed actually a gender quota um, for, for California public company boards. And just recently, the California Partners Project, CPP um, project has put out data that shows that 665 women were put on California public company boards to meet uh, the legislative requirements out of this bill at the end of 2019 or since the bill was passed in 2018. But what's interesting about this is that the thresholds actually ratchet up year over year. So 
by the end of 2021, there's another threshold. For example, um, by the end of 2019, companies are required to have at least one woman on their board. But by the end of 2021, depending on the size of the board, they're actually required to have more. So, you know, if it's a board with six people on it, they have to have, you know, three women. They so there's different there's different sort of levels of uh, how many women you're required to have, creating another 670 board seats available for women simply in the next 12 months. So you can think about the massive movement and, of course, the impact that that's had on boardrooms for public companies in California. Um, and then, you know, of course, over the last um, six months or so, there has been a dramatic increase on people of color in the boardroom as well. And the, one of the great criticisms, I think, of the le legislation in 2018 that focused so much on gender was that it did not include any information about other forms of diversity, people of color or otherwise. Um, and so just this year, uh, just a couple of months ago, actually, California passed uh, almost the exact same legislation, but as it applies to racial diversity, racial and ethnic diversity. So I anticipate that we will see some of the same dynamics we've seen play out with the 2018 bill for women. Um, with people of color in California. So just a dramatic, I just wanted to walk through that because I think, you know, we have these external forces of what's happening in the business landscape that's driving us towards more diverse boards or the need for more diverse boards uh, and different perspectives around the table, as well as just a dramatic shift in the context, landscape, policy, um, et cetera, around us. So the result is that it's offered a lot of opportunity for diverse candidates. As I mentioned, 665 um, women will join boards in the, by the end of 2021. And just, you know, the board list is a, um, is a marketplace that connects uh, diverse individuals with board opportunities. And we've seen a 4x increase on a monthly basis just since the beginning of this year. So just to indicate a little bit the amount of demand that we're seeing on boards for diverse candidates. There's, as I said, hardly a boardroom out there that isn't talking about this topic. Um, but what's challenging about it is how to, one, you know, we get a lot of questions from boards. We have this intention, we have this desire to create a more diverse boardroom, but we're not quite sure how to get started or how to find the right talent. How do we break down some of these barriers that have prevented us from creating a diverse boardroom in the past. And so that is the topic for today um, and why Elena is joining us. So let's just jump in. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see Elena here. Um, Elena, I'd love, you know, as we get started, just to hear a little bit about your story. I mean, obviously you're serving on a couple of boards already um, would love to hear about Fujitsu and Smartsheet, um, and just would be curious to hear one a little bit about your journey into that board, into those boardrooms, um, and how you selected those two companies to be the boards that you would join. Yeah, thanks, Shannon, and and thanks, Kelly, for the the uh, nice intro and go Bears. I just have to say that in my out loud voice. Um, I'm also on the board of the Huff School of Business, so um, just being here is it feels great uh, to to participate. Um, so a little bit about me. I, I did um, join two boards. Uh, probably, gosh, it's been three to four years. Uh, both of them were pre IPO companies. And what they were looking for was a skill set. Um, so they, there was not the legislation that uh, exists today, uh, Shannon, that just came came out in the last, uh, I would say, 12 to 24 months. Um, but the both CEOs were looking for someone with a specific skill. Uh, and they also had the foresight to know that they needed to have diversity. I happened to be on a board for PagerDuty. And if you don't know Jennifer Tahati, you should just follow her because she's an amazing female leader. And if there's someone I think about when I think about diversity, it's her. And so as I was evaluating the board, which by the way, pager duty was the second board I joined. Um, I actually started the conversation with Jennifer saying, I actually don't have time <laughs> uh, to join your board, but, but I just wanted to meet you because I had a, a, a crush on you for a long time because of how important you place diversity. And of course, that crush turned into, okay, I'll be on your board, basically. Um, but part of it was because she put that first and continues to do that. Um, and, you know, the way she goes about making sure everyone in the room's voice is heard is just, uh, it's just incredible. Um, but that's how I joined the, the pager duty board. It was really her reaching out to me and that was a referral from my boss. Um, so like you said earlier, Shannon, a lot of this is within your network of people. 
Um, but I also think to your point, sometimes, sometimes our network can be homogeneous. So we have to just be careful with that because it's easier to obviously get someone in your network, but at some point you have to take that risk. Uh, the smart sheet board, which was also uh, a pre IPO company was looking for a specific skill. They wanted a public company CFO. Uh, and so I happened to, uh, meet Mark and meet the management team. And I felt, uh, the values that he and I had were very consistent uh, and that is something really important. Those of you who are evaluating being on boards, uh, consider where the company is and their values and do they prioritize diversity? If that's important to you, you should definitely be asking that as you're, as you're evaluating boards. Hmm. So uh, and then Haas, uh, Kelly, and I mean, Kelly really reached out to me to join the EGAL board. And, and then I, I also joined the Haas board. So um, that was just luck, I think, to be honest. Yeah, and well, and um, forgive me if you touched on this and I missed it, but on the smart sheet board, was that also a connection through your network? Because it sounds like Haas and Pager Duty board both were. Yeah, actually, it was. Um, pay, a smart sheet was, uh, you know, as a CFO, you're always working with investment bankers. It's just part of the cadence of your role. And so uh, the banker that I was working with said, hey, I, I know this amazing CEO. He would love to have a female on his board, but he's really looking for a CFO. And so he was actually, he was very honest with me and said, look, I'm evaluating uh, a few candidates, CFOs. Some are men, some are women. Uh, I would love to have you on my board. I already have a female leader, but I just, I want to add more diversity to my board. And so, so I met him and it was, it was great from there. Great. Have you seen within the context of um, of the boards that you're serving on, have you seen a shift in the way that those boards are thinking about composition? I don't know how much opportunity has come up to add new directors or at a minimum think about succession planning. Have you seen a shift in the way that you're having the conversation around diversity or the types of candidates that you're um, looking to bring on since some of these things that I, I just talked about, the legislation and some of these other policies have um, been put in place? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, you said it right there. There isn't a nom committee out there that's not paying attention to diversity on the board. And so I would say it's not only it's so important, it's become a board topic. Usually the nom nominating committee will do their thing and they'll find the candidates. But there hasn't been a board meeting this year in both of my boards if this has not come up as a topic. So that's a good thing. Like the fact that the conversation is happening is great. Uh, in both cases, um, you know, no longer are we, I mean, we are always tapping our network, of course, um, but both, I'm lucky and fortunate that both of the CEOs and the nom nominating uh, chair committee uh, know, know and understand that we have to broaden the network beyond who we know. Uh, and so there's a few things we're doing differently. One is they're absolutely going to a search firm who focuses on diverse talent. Uh, that's just, a, just mandatory at this point. Uh, not because they don't trust our network, but more because we want to expand the pool of candidates we're looking for. Uh, the second thing I would say is um, diversity can be measured in different ways. Um, it used to be, well, as long as there's female and, and male, gender was the, the primary diversity stat that people were looking at. Uh, and in reality, we're broadening that to be more about, you know, what skills do candidates bring to the table? Um, not only gender, but race. Um, and even um, outside of what would be normal, what I would call what is viewed as normal uh, recruiting practices, which is I'm going to go get a CFO or I'm going to get a sitting CIO. Well, what about I go to someone who is at a university who talks about these topics or, you know, why don't we broaden our reach beyond just what, what has been historically the, the easy path or the, the traditional path? Uh, and so we're, we're doing things like that, that are a little bit different than I would say in the past where it's just easy to go to your network and say, Hey, we need to add someone to this table. Does anyone have a friend who's smart that miss, meets this criteria? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting to hear your, um, anecdotal evidence of that, because what we see, you know, at, at sort of the broader level is that there has absolutely been a shift in kind of definition of what a, what a great board director looks like. I don't mean visually, but just what their what their profile is. You know, historically, it's been a sitting CEO, sitting CFO um, that has board experience. Well, there's yeah. a chicken and egg problem in there in and of itself. But um, yeah. if you don't have board experience, how do you get it to be a new director? So it's not surprising that we have a lot of people that are serving on 
many boards and then this really strong pipeline of people who are really having trouble getting their first board um, because right. of that kind of perception that you need to have governance um, experience. And in some cases that is truly a criteria. In other cases, I think it's kind of a fallback definition. Right, um, right. But we also have seen, I think because some of these changing um, dynamics in business in general, a greater need for more specialized expertise. So we see a lot of demand for emerging technology, expertise in emerging technologies or right. expertise in a particular customer segment, as I mentioned, women or millennials, um, you know, more kind of digital transformation, digital marketing expertise. So these actually tend to be areas where one, you know, oftentimes the candidate base will skew a little bit younger and two, um, it's broadening beyond the CFO CEO ranks where actually those roles historically have been more diverse pipelines in general. Right, right. Um, and so that's been kind of an interesting shift. So it's, it, it's um, interesting to hear you say that, as, that you're starting to, your boards are starting to think about the definition of what would be valuable perspective in the boardroom um, evolve a little bit too. Yeah. And I, and I know from, even from my own experience, you know, on my Zendesk board and, and this was, uh, you know, I was fortunate that Zendesk was also a very uh, diversity first kind of mindset, including their board. And um, the way that we craft our board was really to think about every management team leader, uh, myself included, should have like a buddy on the board um, mm -hmm. that has had their job uh, before. So that, you know, in those moments when you need, you know, like the, the lifeline or someone to call, you have your buddy on the board that can get, uh, offer that perspective. So if you think about that framework on our management team, we have a chief marketing officer, we have a chief product officer, we have a CIO. And so we have various disciplines on our management team. And therefore, by definition, if you follow that framework, then you're going to have a diverse set of skill sets on the board and just by, by having that, you're going to open up more, um, I, I was about to say more TAM, <laughs> total available market, <laughs> but, no, uh, but effectively that's what you're doing. You're opening it, you know, you know, expanding your reach because you really are looking for a diverse set of skills. Right. Uh, and so that's proven really well. And if you ask our management team, you know, most of them would say they, you know, depending, but most of us would say we like our buddy because it's someone uh, who, who is an advisor that you can reach out to that you know, knows and has lived in your world. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, often that, that, that can be just a diverse set of skills around the table. That's great. Um, related to this, there was a question, uh, we were already getting some questions coming through. Uh, oh, chat, great, yeah. Chat and Q&A. Um, there's a question about this difference between diversity of opinion versus demographic diversity. Uh, you know, would be curious, we touched a little bit on it, but curious if um, you have any other comments on um, the value of either or sort of how to think about the differences between those two. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... Gosh, I don't have a strong, passionate opinion on that, but I, I think uh, if I were to look at the complexion of, like, first of all, you want diversity of opinion, and by having a diverse set of leaders around the table, um, you are going to generate that. And I think that's that's when you get the best outcomes. And there's so many, I'm sure you know you know these, Shannon. There's so many data points that can prove to that, uh, proof points for that. Um, but I think both are important. And I think demographic diversity, um, absolutely critical as well. I think they're both important. I don't think you can, do one dominates the other, or one's more important than the other. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I'll take one other question here from the chat and we'll sort of flip back and forth. Um, is there, there's a question asking if there's any data from California or anywhere that shows that increasing the number of women on boards leads to changes in business operation or gender equality practices in the company. Um, I'm, I'm happy to tackle that based on the data I know. And Elena yeah, please, please. I don't have the data right at the, at my fingertips. Yeah. So, um, what I, I don't know if this specifically answers your question, but what there is ample data on is um, financial metrics and company performance. So what we do know is that specifically, I, I have, I've seen studies for gender uh, diversity. I've not seen as many for racial and ethnic diversity. Um, but so in your question is specifically about women. So um, there, is, uh, there is a study that shows that when you have uh, kind of a tipping point number of women. So I think that tipping point is often, you, you may have heard of kind of this rule of 30%. 
um, for a bunch of reasons. One is that when you have one woman in a boardroom, oftentimes, or one diverse individual in the boardroom related to, to the rest of the board, um, oftentimes you don't get the full benefit of having that diversity of um, opinion until you sort of reach 30%. Um, of the total board. Um, and that that's somewhat anecdotal, but there's also, a, and just kind of a feeling from candidates and boards of when they start to reap the benefit of that overall kind of perspective. Um, but there is data that shows um, at that 30% mark, you see company financial metrics actually start to diverge from companies that don't have that kind of diversity. Um, so, and that's, that's, on, that's on a number of return on equity, um, uh, profitability, et cetera. There are a number of, um, of financial metrics that show that companies that have more diverse boards, specifically gender diversity, um, perform better than those that don't. Um, in terms of kind of culture impact, I think that's harder to, and my sense is your question is a little bit about the way that um, operations are run or the way that the business is managed. I think that's a little bit harder to measure. And perhaps that's why I haven't seen any concrete studies around that. Alina, have you come across? No, that? I haven't. I've seen more of what you just talked about, Shannon, which is um, financial results, uh, net profits and, and so on being improved when there's a diverse and really around gender. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything beyond that at this point. Really, uh, I think that question makes me realize uh, quite a bit more research needs to be done there. One, we need the, the data around racial and ethnic diversity, and two, it would be helpful to understand a little bit more some of the other types of impact that are made on the organization. So great question. Um, so uh, one, one thing that I wanted to ask, Elena, and then I'll get back to the group's question. Sure. Um, a lot of companies, we, we talk to a lot of companies all the time that are really interested in hiring a diverse board director. And to this point we were discussing earlier, um, while they express that intent, they sort of default to these more traditional definitions of board directors, which um, with you as a very notable exception, oftentimes, you know, in kind of those CEO, CFO ranks, you know, I think we're at 5% or something of CEOs in the US are women overall. Right. Um, so, how, and this actually leads, I think, to that perceived pipeline problem. So when we do hear people talk about that, it's, well, you know, how can you say there's this huge supply of candidates? When I go out on my sort of narrow definition of what I'm looking for, I'm not finding candidates that I can add to my board. Um, have you seen boards think differently about or creatively about the criteria? I know you mentioned, you know, um, tapping more into kind of academia and thinking a bit more, less traditionally about the definition of a board director. But anything you add, you would add there um, in terms of building a robust slate of diverse candidates and the criteria that's been helpful in doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it goes back to really um, expanding, you know, expanding the the reach that you have and, and not being so narrow in your definition of diversity, number one, and not limiting it only to CEOs and CFOs. I think that's really critical. Um, and then expanding to non-traditional paths, uh, like, like I mentioned. Um, but also, I think it's really important to um, not assume candidates will come to you, um, mm -hmm. but you have to go where the candidates are. And so often you have to tap into things like the board list or other organizations, EGAL. I mean, every one of these, him for her, um, there's so many organizations who are trying to help with this cause. Um, and then even double clicking below that, e even just the way we do for our own searches in our own companies. You know, I had this recent example where, and, and Kelly knows this, I was trying to hire finance talent in my own organization, all levels, literally like the most junior to the most senior. And I did not see one Hispanic candidate. And it just baffled me. It was like, I don't, I don't understand why do I, and, and obviously I'm Hispanic, so that's close to my heart, but I just did not see a diverse set of candidates. So what I did is I reached out to, um, you know, Latinas in tech and said, help me, you know, help me find, I reached out to Kelly. And so these are things as leaders in organizations we have to do and, and doing a board search is very much very similar. You know, reach out to, to where the candidates are is probably the biggest uh, piece of advice. Uh, you're not going to find them, even though there are many candidates who want to be on boards, um, filtering for what you need and what you need on your board to complement the other board members you have, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why sometimes I think getting a search firm who's really going to where candidates are and you and your recruiting team doing that uh, is really critical. Great. 
Um, well, we have a we have a very active audience here, so I'm just going to shift right over to yeah, this, go for it, um, which is great. Uh, so, a couple of things about this. Um, this is a question that just came through about suggestions or recommendations for how to overcome that first holder, that first um, hurdle of not having governance experience. So this kind of chicken and egg problem that we were talking about, um, you know, particularly uh, when you've been in a male dominant industry, um, which doesn't provide a lot of opportunities to enable women to move up in the organization and gain that experience. So are there things people can do shy of having governance experience to kind of position themselves well for that first board role? Yeah, I mean, the way I, the one thing I didn't say and I should have said is I did spend time on a nonprofit board uh, just a couple of years. And I'll tell you how valuable that was for me, um, which uh, I still, I still don't know all the jargon. You know, I've been on two boards, three boards, and uh, sometimes someone will say, like, do we have a decision? I forget the exact words. Uh, and I would have never known, oh, that means I've got to say something like, um, I do, or I, I don't know, there's these words that people use in words, <laughs> right? And I would not have known that. I would have not have known there's a nom and gov committee. I would have not known there's a comp committee. I would have not known there's an audit committee. Um, and so, and, and even just the way boards are run, minutes and all these things. And so to the extent you can get yourself fluent on those terms, mm -hmm. um, I think that's important if you can, if you have the time. Um, and I also know a lot of um, board organizations offer training. Uh, and so doing things just like you would prepare for a job, getting those skill sets and making them very visible is, is I think, valuable um, because it is a chicken and the egg. Someone's got to take a chance on you and will. Someone took a chance on me. Uh, I never thought that would happen, but they did. Um, and so that some of that was because I had um, nonprofit board experience and I, I did art, that I think was critical. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, some of it was because I, I had this skill set that they were looking for. And so amplify the skills you have and look for boards that have gaps in those skills you have. Um, I think that is a, a very important um, part of the way to look for the right board role. And at the same time, you as recruiting board members looking for, okay, what do I already have on my board today? And where do I have a gap? And then focus your efforts on that gap. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, there, there was another question actually in the um, Q&A about nonprofit boards. So maybe let's take another moment to sure. address that. Sure. I find, um, what we find with, with nonprofit boards is, uh, or I, I guess as I would distill sort of my comments on nonprofit boards, um, point number one is that if you are passionate about a topic and want to serve on a nonprofit board, you absolutely should. That is reason number one to right. serve on a nonprofit right. board. The, the second piece is that it's interesting to hear your perspective because in general, I would say that for-profit boards don't necessarily equate nonprofit governance experience with for-profit governance um, yeah, yeah. experience. But that's that there's a few caveats to that. One is the quality of nonprofit board you're serving on, right? So if it's a very large and very well-run board, exactly. um, yep. I think that there's a, there's an exception there. Um, the other is that this is, especially if it's a well-run board of a large organization, um, with a with a sizable budget, um, oftentimes the other people serving on that board are people that are also serving on for profit boards. So even as kind of a network extension, it's a great idea. So yeah, I, think yeah. the, I I would just encourage people as you think about nonprofit board service for all the reasons that Elena said, but in addition, you know these few other benefits um, to absolutely pursue that. I think there's no downside to getting um, nonprofit experience. Yeah, and I would I would echo and make sure the point is heard that. A, do it if you have passion, you know, for, I, I did it because I really believed in helping underserved, you know, middle school kids um, because I didn't have that experience, you know, so it was something I was passionate about, but the knockoff effect for me personally was I had more confidence actually speaking with prospective board opportunities, even though they're maybe not equatable exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it just gave me confidence as I walked into that board meeting. Uh, this feels a little bit familiar, you know, um, so that was part of it. Um, but I, I would agree with you that A, you have to have the time and the passion. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it just to get the experience to then go get on, on another board. Um, yeah. That's just not the, the right anchor, uh, especially since time is limited. Great. Uh, and I would also echo Shannon one other thing, which is the board members I sat on 
that nonprofit board have become uh, uh, effectively opportunities for like the, all of them are trying to get me on some board, you know, profit <laughs> board. Uh, and likewise, I'm doing the same with them. So like you said, I think the relationships that you build in, in other networks can really help you. Great. Yeah, there are, there's mixed questions here, both about how getting, how to get on a board and then, you know, what to do if you're on a board and, and facing some challenges. So I'll, I'll take a couple more on the um, getting on a board front before we move on to what's happening in the boardrooms. Sure. Uh, curious, I, there was a question um, in here about the optimal number of boards to join. And I know you actually, in our prior conversations, have been talking a little bit about expectations around time commitment and you know how to think about your capacity to give to boards. How should one think about that? Yeah, gosh. Um, well, let me start by saying there, there's so many amazing boards that I would love to be on um, and I can't. And that's simply because I don't have the bandwidth. Uh, and, and so all of you have your own, you know personally what your bandwidth is. Um, and so I go back to, like for me, I'm on two boards. I'm actually on three boards. Um, two profit boards and obviously Haas, um, and they all uh, do a few things. One is they make me a better CFO. Um, and so that's, that's the part of the exchange, but it does require bandwidth that often you don't really have. You know, it's gotta get carved out from somewhere. So either you're carving it out because you have room in your day-to-day -day job to do that, or you're taking time away from your family. Uh, I mean, that's ultimately kind of how it works for me. So often, um, you know, if I'm preparing for a board day, let's say the next day, it means I'm preparing the evening prior or the week prior or the weekend prior where I could be hiking with my family or whatever. So just know that that level of, of commitment is, is what's needed. Now, if you have passion, like I do for the three boards I'm on, I'm willing to make that trade-off, but I know that about myself. Uh, and so I would just encourage people to think through the trade-off you're making because time is finite. We all know that. Um, and, and the passion you have. And also, this is a multi-year commitment, typically. It's not a, it's not a six-month commitment. It's not a one-year commitment. It is a multi-year commitment. And so always think about it in those terms. Can I see myself on this board in four years? Mm -hmm. Can I see myself on this board in three years? What impact am I going to gain, uh, make? And what am I also going to learn uh, from this role? Great. Um, all right, well, we'll shift a little bit to the other side of the equation, which is um, boards and sort of how to think about building a diverse board room. Um, there was a question that came through about um, how, if we are an, if we are an individual who is very passionate about bringing diversity into the board that we're serving on, but are facing resistance with other board directors, um, I don't know if that's a situation that you face. But any advice for how to have those kinds of conversations or um, drive that kind of impact or influence uh, in the boardroom, given just the dynamic that there isn't really a hierarchy or leadership structure there to lean on? How do you wield influence, particularly on this topic? Yeah, that's a, that, I'm going to say that's a very tough topic, um, but I would approach it the way, and I've been fortunate I haven't had that uh, resistance, but I would approach it in the way I approach uh, a work challenge when I'm trying to influence someone else who I know is not on the same page. Uh, and usually data helps, you know, having a data-driven approach uh, to it, I think helps, and benchmarking. Um, and so right now there's so much data out there about the importance of diversity on boards and, and what all the other organizations are doing. So that should be one easy way, easy is maybe strong, but um, the best way I would say to have that conversation. Uh, and then I would also just dig underneath, why is there resistance? What is it about the resistance that's the blocker here to really get yourself into the into the shoes of that person and understand where they're coming from. But that, that's how I would approach it. It's just like I would any other business problem. Yeah, we, I, I've had a lot of conversations with candidates about this concern of being, you know, maybe the only woman on the board, maybe the only African-American, et cetera, and feeling like suddenly the, the burden or the topic of diversity 
falls on their shoulders to always be raising um, or that, you know, that's a perspective that the board expects them to bring to the table because they are the candidate that perhaps doesn't look like the others in the boardroom. Yeah. Um, and so I, I have, you know, had these discussions and sort of problem solving it with candidates. And what I have heard people say that is, it has been effective has been establishing kind of allyship and rather than necessarily going into the boardroom and coming out with, you know, all the perspective and uh, on your own, um, kind of preceding that a little bit with others on the board Absolutely. and to find somebody Absolutely. to support that voice and maybe even be the lead voice in it so that it's not constantly coming from one person in the boardroom. Right. No, I think that 100%. And I think that's the natural dynamic that happens in the board, Shannon, on whether it's a diversity topic and bringing on new board members, but even problem solving as a board, you know, when there's a conflict in a boardroom, oftentimes uh, a lot of conversation happens in the quote unquote hallway outside the boardroom. And a lot of that is about building and understanding, okay, where is everyone on this topic? Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that's happened on, on all of my boards um, where, you know, there's a, there's a conversation happening on the side to help make the board discussion more productive in the room. And by having an understanding where your allies are, you know where to spend your time. Uh, and you're, you're right, it's not one person in the room. And the other thing I would say about diversity is we're not done just because you hire the Latina audit committee chair. Like this is an evolution that is never done. Uh, and so I, I'm, you know, the one thing I would say for everyone is don't assume like you get two board members and, you know, they fit the, the criteria of diversity and then you're done. It's all also just like we do with employees. How do you effectively onboard those leaders uh, onto your board to make them successful? How do they, how do you create an inclusive environment on your board as well? And, and just like we do with our employees, we have to do that with our board. And, and I can tell you, we will never be done with diversity in, in, for the next hundred years. It just will not be done. And so getting that mindset of this is an evolution, not a, let me check that box and now we're good. It's an evolution that will constantly be evolving and the, the, the composition of your board will constantly be evolving. And that, that I believe will be a great outcome for companies as they evolve and grow. Yeah, it is, it is interesting because I do think sometimes we fall into the trap of, um, well, I'm focused on diversity on my board. And so I'm actively focused on the recruiting process and you know, bringing people on that have a diverse perspective or background. Um, but then we sort of forget that in order to reap the rewards of having that diversity around the table, there are things that we have to do to create an inclusive environment to make sure that all the diverse perspectives that we have brought around the table and work so hard to get there um, are actually contributing in, in the ways that, that um, we had hoped. So I think right. that's a good point. Um, anything actually that you've seen done, you, you mentioned um, onboarding, but are there any specific practices that you've seen done on your boards that has, have been effective in creating those inclusive environments? You know, we have not been as intentional um, on it in terms of creating an inclusive environment uh, necessarily. But the one thing, at least on both our, my boards that I'm, I'm fortunate about is uh, everyone's opinion. There's a culture of we want to hear from everyone. You know, just the way I've been fortunate that I've worked around these boards where hey, it's incredibly diverse, but also, um, you know, we, we encourage each other to have the debate, mm. you know, the healthy debate. And, and we're not always all on the same page, um, but we would rather hear from everyone than, than not. And that's just a culture of the board. And so if you join a board or if you get someone who, or if you're trying to recruit someone on the board, uh, one way to ask if they have that, you know, mindset is how do you work on inclusivity in your workplace? Um, how do I do it? The way I do it at Zendesk is if I'm in a meeting and I see there's one female in me, I'm going to ask that female to speak up. Um, and in the same way, I would approach a board meeting. If I feel like the conversation is being dominated by one or two people, um, I'm going to ask everyone else to speak up. And that's just my role as a leader to, to help. And so Having people with that mindset, I think, is where it starts. But I haven't seen anything, any specific practice, Shannon, that, that other than just individuals just taking that on. Yeah, great. Have you uh, seen anything? Uh, I'm curious. Um, you know, one specific thing that I have heard uh, boards that have been effective for some of the boards that we worked um, with 
is the, in the onboarding process, establishing this kind of buddy program, especially for someone, if the, if the new board director has not served on the board before, um, but even if they have, I think there's always some unique and specific things to each board that requires a little bit of just adjustment and getting used to. And, and there isn't a great way to learn about them unless somebody directly tells you. So yeah. Yeah. Buddy, helping, helping with that process and, and, and the buddy inherently then is focused on making sure that one, that new director is comfortable in the boardroom and that the board is, um, tapping into the expertise that they hired that person for. Right. Uh, I think that level of focus um, is, can, can be helpful. Yeah, I also think uh, now you're reminding me that um, in both boards, when I was onboarded, we did have an informal dinner, um, which was nothing to do with, with the board topics, but more just, mm-hmm. hey, Elena's new, we don't know her, she's in town, let's go have dinner and, um, that informal setting, you know, we can't do that today, obviously with Zoom, but you can still mock up an informal setting to really bring uh, everyone together during an onboarding. I think that's really critical. Mm -hmm. I I do believe that building an amazing board requires a lot of trust across board members. Some of that trust comes from building that relationship outside the boardroom. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, and that responsibility, I think, in many ways, sits with the board chair to be cognizant that, that those relationships need space to grow. And I, I mean, in COVID, it's particularly difficult to do. I don't know exactly how you have an onboarding Zoom cocktail hour, but <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think it is uh, that is a critical component of building trust and those longer term relationships that show up um, in decision making later on. Yeah. Um, I, this is a little bit of a sticky topic, but I think it's important to raise, even if we don't have direct answers to it. Um, sure. I I have had a number of conversations, particularly as over the last many months, there has been a dramatic increase in demand for men and women of color on boards. Um, this, this concern or sort of feedback that I've gotten from candidates of color Um, saying that they have felt in the interview process like the only reason that they're being talked to about the opportunity is because they are a a person of color Um, and that that's expressed to them or communicated to them in some way from the board. And I'm curious. And then on the flip side, I've also talked to board directors that say, how do we handle this? Because the reality is we want diversity on our boards, but we don't want to communicate that in a way that makes someone feel like that's the only reason we're talking to them or that there's a, that there are a token in any way. I, I'd just be curious your thoughts on that or if there are ways to kind of handle situations like that, that um, again, in the spirit of creating an inclusive environment and ensuring that you know, people are, are sort of feel like they are very clear on the reasons that they're in the boardroom and how they can um, be delivering value. Sure. I mean, I think I think it starts with um, understanding. So I would say two things. One is from the candidate's perspective, you know, my gut instinct, if you really feel like you're, you know, a token, uh, it may not be the right, you know, it might not be the right board uh, opportunity for you, given that there are so many amazing opportunities out there. So don't settle. Um, but also uh, thinking and taking the long view, just like a CEO and CFO and the management team does, you know, where we are today as an organization and where we want to be uh, is an important, I think, question you can ask any board chair or CEO as you're thinking about joining a board, you know, tell me about the diversity on your board today and where you want to be and what my role fits into that over the long term. You that will lead to question that will lead to a dialogue naturally around hey, over time, I want the board to have these skills. I want the diversity of skills. I want the diversity of gender and race. However they describe it could tell you a lot about how they're thinking about it and how you might fit into that as opposed to it being a very transactional, I got to check this box and you fit in that box. Like that That. That conversation, I think, is narrow by, by nature. So you have to broaden the conversation to more than just the short term. Uh, and I think that works on both sides. Um, if I was a CEO and I didn't have a diverse board, uh, I would try to try to flip it very quickly and add, you know, add more than one, uh, diverse candidate, but also I would share with the candidate how I think about the composition of the board over time, Mm -hmm. just like you should ask that as a, as a CEO or chair, I would be sharing that. And I would, you know, just throw it out there to say, 
Um, you know, we, we have not done well in this department, but I would want you as a candidate to help me change the, you know, change the pattern on this, on this board, change the composition of this board uh, mm -hmm. and enroll them in part of the problem solving. So it's not just checking the box, but really helping the organization over time. Mm -hmm. I like your point also about, um, sharing the composition of the board and specifically just referring back to a comment you made earlier about actually doing a skills matrix when you're thinking about you know as for those in the audience that might not be familiar with that process a best practice around recruiting or succession planning for a board director is to be quite thoughtful about the skills that you have represented already in the boardroom and how they actually match up to the strategic needs or challenges that you expect the company to have over the next say three to five years and pretty quickly, if you put that on a matrix, you should identify, gosh, we've got a risk and a gap in X, Y, or Z area. Maybe it's supply chain expertise, or maybe it's um, whatever the gap is. And you can do that around industry expertise, functional expertise, you know, demographic perspective. Um, there are a lot of different ways to build those. But I think if you've done that homework in advance of having a conversation with a candidate, you're in a much better position to explain here's why we're talking to you. <laughs> right, absolutely. We, we actually have done the work to identify where we have risk and gap in our board. Um, and you know, you might not check all of those boxes, but like on a number of fronts, you, you would add a tremendous amount of value to where this company is headed. So I think that's a nice way to be thoughtful about who you're talking to and why and be able to communicate to them the, the value you're hoping to get out of them. as a uh, Absolutely. And the skill set on both sides, you know, both as the CEO recruiting and understanding where your gaps are and how this candidate fits. But then the flip side is you as a candidate saying, okay, if I look at the composition of the board, I can see clearly how my skills kind of meet a gap that this organization has and where I can contribute and add value. So it's both sides, I, I would say. Great. Um, perfect. Well, I, I am amazed at the number of questions that we have had come in here. So I'm just scanning to make sure I capture. And I apologize to those. I probably will not get to all these given that we only have seven minutes left and I, there's like 15 questions here. Um, but let's see. Um, you know, there have been a lot of questions that have come through. I'll try to tackle multiple questions at once around um, access to resources. So both on and this is getting a little bit more tactical than some of the high level questions we've been talking about thus far. But um, specifically any search firms or resources um, that you have found useful uh, in identifying great diverse candidates for boards? Yeah, I, um, I can definitely send along a couple of names. Uh, I can't think of them top of mind. I was, I was thinking about that as someone, I saw the question, I was like, ah, which is the firm? Um, because I'm not the one doing the nom and gov, but I know that they're using search firms. So I'm happy to share it with okay. Kelly or, or uh, Jennifer afterwards. Um, especially since a lot of my, both my boards are actively looking uh, today and we've been successful. Um, but I, I do think Shannon, like connecting with, um, similar to I said earlier, that go to where the candidates are. So connecting and understanding, you know, if I really were to find a black candidate, what are the organizations that they're joining? Where, where are all the Latino, Latina uh, leaders? What organizations are they a part of? Uh, and use those as vehicles because there's so many communities out there. It's hard to put them all in one place, but I think leverage those and go to where the candidates are is super critical. Yeah. Yeah. I'd add on that just, just because I'm in this business, I'll, yeah. I'll look at a couple more resources. Um, one, you know, in the official kind of recruiting space, certainly there are search firms and um, Elena or I could provide um, some names there that, that would be good resources. Um, and then there are also a number of online tools like the board list, for example, the only, you know, we've got uh, about 18,000 members in our community and only have diverse candidates um, as a part of that database. And there are others out there like that. So explore those. And then um, to Elena's point, there are a number of organizations. Well, I'd actually break it down maybe into two groups. There are a number of industry associations and nonprofits that have a specific racial or gender um, or ethnic kind of focus to them. Um, many of whom we partner with explicitly to get um, access to and sort of elevate those candidates for board opportunities, but they can also be great sources. They oftentimes just maintain their own databases um, of, of candidates. So I think there are a number of resources. The most important thing I would say, regardless of what resource you pursue is that 
um, you are actively pursuing uh, resources outside of your immediate network. I think the most dangerous thing and the hardest, or the way that boards get stuck is when they do just rely on the people they've worked with in the past, the people they've served on boards with in the past. Because even if we take racial and gender diversity to the side, it really narrows the pool of talent that you're able to get access to. And it might seem like the world to you, um, but again, networks are by definition limited. And so um, the more you rely on them, the less access you're gonna get to different perspectives by any definition. So um, I think the most important well thing is having attention. Um, yeah, well, really well said. Around it. Um, all right. Oh, and there's even been um, a suggestion in the in the comments of search firms. So I'm co confident we'll be able to compile a list. Yeah, we can get a list together. Yeah, for sure. I'm not out. Um, I am going to do maybe just one more question, um, and then we'll close out here. And again, thank you all so much for these um, thoughtful questions. Uh, there was uh, actually I'll just touch briefly on there was there were a couple of questions about actual diversity data and I'm more than happy again in the in a follow up we can kind of detail out some of the statistics that we've talked about it, it looked like that might be useful for um, for several of the people in the chat. Um, all right, I would say let's. Um, there, there have also been questions. I'll take it back to kind of the candidate perspective to close out because I know that's always such an um, interesting topic for so many as they think about their board journey. Um, there was a question in here about how to get, there was a question specifically about how candidates should connect with search firms, but I'll take the liberty of broadening that and say, if I am somebody who's interested in a board opportunity, never served on a board before, how would you recommend I start thinking about this and getting my name out there? How can my name show up in some of these conversations that, that are happening in the boardroom? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so uh, what I would do if I had, if I was, if no one knew who Elena Gomez was um, today and I wanted to get on a board, um, first thing I would do is start talking to people who are on boards uh, today just to find out their journey and, and everyone has a different journey and, no, and there's no one journey that's right. Um, I would also create my bio um, and understand like what are the skills that I'm bringing to a board and be very clear on, on what, what value you're bringing and what you're looking for. Understand what your objective is by being on a board. What, it, what is the outcome you want for Elena Gomez, but then what is the value Elena Gomez is going to give to an organization and be very clear on that uh, and prioritize uh, within that because there may be multiple opportunities and you'll have to decide. Um, and then I would go through normal search, you know, recruiting headhunter firms. That, that's where a lot of board opportunities get presented to me. Um, and in the past, in the early part of my career, it was job opportunities being presented to me. Um, those same search firms often have a board practice. And so letting them know that that's something that you're interested in, even if it's not today, you know, um, even if you say, hey, in two years, I want to be on a board or in one year, I want to be on a board, um, you know, you're going to take a lot of at bats before you actually hit the ball. So you're going to see a lot of opportunities before you decide, yep, this is the board. And so just know that that is also part of the process. Great, great advice. Um, well, we're right at time. So I will just say thank you so much, Elena, for your insight and wisdom. I think it is invaluable to have somebody who is has the perspective of multiple boards, for-profit, non-profit, um, share with us some of those insights. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you so much to Haas for this partnership and for bringing these uh, events to this audience. I think um, it's a tremendous opportunity for all of us to just pause and think about um, how we can advance boardrooms by uh, increasing diversity. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have co-hosted the event with you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thanks everybody for attending. Yeah, thank you as well, Shannon and Kelly, for having me. I, I, I had a wonderful time. And uh, if I can offer, you know, just any advice, be resilient, keep going, going after it, you know, go get on a board, go hire the best diverse talent. It never, it never stops. Great. Thank you all. Thanks. <laughs>